everyone. Welcome to the FII View with me, Tanvir Gill, right here in the Mumbai News Center. My guest today on the show is Sam Mehtani, who's Director of Emerging Market Equities at FNC Investments. He has almost 20 years of experience managing EM-dedicated assets. He manages funds with specific focus on India, China, Korea, as well as Latin America. Sam, it's so good to have you on the show. Thanks very much for taking out the time and speaking with us. Let me get your EM view first. And, you know, given that we have halfway through the year, how have you changed your EM strategy for the second half of this year? Has 2013 uh, as an EM equity story disappointed you so far? Well, clearly EMs have disappointed um, in uh, 2013. When you look at the, uh, the benchmark MSCI index, it's down around about 10% in dollar terms, um, significantly lagging some of the developed markets like the UK, US and Europe. So yes, the overall sort of um, the emerging markets kind of story for, for so far for this year has been a bit disappointing, but we've not changed our stance um, or any of our kind of main positions. Um, you know, we still think um, looking out over the next 12, 18 months, the, you know, the outlook for emerging markets looks attractive and um, you know we're sticking with some of our key key bets um, in emerging markets going forward. Yeah, but Sam, you've stated uh, that the EM story will improve over the next six months. What will lead to the improvement there? China and India continue to face downgrades in growth and earnings. Uh, you know, you're not seeing the investment cycle pick up. Uh, so, what will drive interest uh, into these markets over the next six months? Well, I think what will basically lead to the improvement is just a realisation that the actual emerging markets picture is not as bad as being perceived at the moment. I think, you know, there has been uh, some significant withdrawals of um, portfolio, uh, you know, flows out of emerging markets so far this year. The bulk of that has gone back into developed equities. People have been concerned about economic growth in countries like China and India and Brazil. I think once we see some signs of stabilisation um, in, you know, monetary policy, for example, in Brazil and India, uh, once we see some better economic data out of China, for example, which we're already seeing, I think people will realise that the actual outlook for emerging markets is not as bad as being perceived at the moment, and I think that will lead to, um, you know, um, a revival in, in interest in emerging markets. Well, one question on everybody's mind, uh, and you know, would want your opinion on that as well, is uh, the possibility of a QE withdrawal in the September Fed policy meet. Uh, do you think the market nervousness right now is pricing that in? Yeah, I do believe the market nervousness at the moment is very much pricing in QE withdrawal um, by September, October. I think that is gen you know, genuinely what the Fed wanted to anchor in terms of market expectations, and it's achieved that goal. So. Um, we do believe the, um, the, the withdrawal of some of that stimulus from QE will happen. Um, I don't particularly have a strong view in terms of the exact timing, the exact month, but it will happen at some point, um, you know, towards the, the latter part of this year. And I think that's very much discounted by, by financial markets. There is, of course, a, a growing perception that 2014 could be a turnaround year for emerging markets versus developed markets. Do you agree with that view? And what if QE withdrawal happens in December? You know, what if they do not decide to start off tapering in September but postpone it to de December? Wouldn't that impact sentiment on emerging markets at the start of 2014? Well, I, I think there could be a good case for a, a rebound, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of um, emerging market equities in 2014. Um, I think one of the critical factors, as I mentioned, is a realisation that um, the economic outlook in some of the key countries like China is not as bad as people believe it is. Um, you know, China will continue to deliver, in our view, seven, just over seven percent GDP growth could be could be around seven and a half percent. Also, at some point, there will be a realization that the current um, measures being taken in countries like Brazil and India, in terms of um, the, the the tightening we've seen in policy, will will stop. And I think there will be a realization that you know, looking forward. You know, central banks can once again look to to relax monetary policy, and I think once we reach that inflection point, people will realise that you know there is an opportunity again in, in emerging market equities. Well, also, want your view on currencies. Now, do you think the dollar strength is likely to continue? And if EM currencies were to rebound from here, do you think that the bounce back would be stronger for currencies like the Brazilian real? and the Russian ruble, uh, given that those nations have a current account surplus versus the Indian rupee, which is uh, also being weighed down uh, by the big current account deficit in the country? 
Well, the currency, I mean, clearly in the very short term, the dollar strength could continue. But um, if, you know, if we believe, and, and we do believe that the, the currency and the, the overall sort of confidence levels and capital flows will um, recover uh, back into emerging markets, we do think that there's a good chance that we do see a, a modest recovery in some of these currencies, which have been sold off quite heavily this year. So, um, you know, the Brazilian real, the Indian rupee, um, clearly in the short term will be very volatile. But we do think once confidence recovers, you could actually see a, a modest recovery in those two currencies, you know, looking out on a 12 month view. You know, Brazil, uh, many believe, uh, is going to be the potential story to watch out for in 2014. Uh, is that uh, uh, the wave of thought that you're also riding? Does that explain your near 20% holding in the region in your fund? Well, Brazil and India are two markets where we, you know, we have found very attractive companies. So the reason for the large weighting in Brazil is largely because of the the, the attractive, high-quality companies we can find there with, with good management, good balance sheets, and strong growth prospects. Um, you know, we believe that there are some very solid, world-class companies in Brazil um, you know, who are worth backing on a, on a medium to long-term view. Companies like Ambev, for example, uh, which is one of the largest beer companies there. Um, and Banco Bradesco, again, one of the, 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 the large banks there. We feel there's a, a number of attractive, um, you know, bottom-up opportunities in Brazil, and that's the reason for the, the large weighting that we have in our portfolios at the moment in Brazil. Sam, have you reduced or increased allocation to India over the last six months? You have uh, an above-average weightage on India, which is 13% versus the benchmark. Uh, what's the view on India? At the margin, we've actually been increasing our weightings in India um, over the last few months. We did start the year with India as being one of our overweight markets. We've actually, as I said, increased positions. We've been focusing, again, very much on the bottom-up uh, opportunities in India. Um, we, as mentioned earlier, we've got a very strong quality bias uh, towards our stock selection. So uh, companies like um, ITC, HDFC Bank, TCS, um, ICICI Bank, they all fit the bill. Um, so we've been using periods of market weakness to actually top up some of our key positions in India um, at the moment. And as I mentioned, it's one of our key overweights going, going forward. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the markets we, we feel you know, offers a lot of good, good high quality companies um, at this point in time. Even though it's uh, off the radar for now, do you think India still risks a ratings downgrade? Well, I think the risk is there, definitely. Um, you know, with the, uh, the sort of situation in India in terms of the, um, the fiscal accounts and the currency, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the politicians and the, um, you know, the, the, the authorities are well aware of that. But clearly, you know, given the, f the fiscal situation and the current account deficit, yes, there is a, there's a obviously clearly always a risk of a, some, some change in rating by the, the rating agencies. You know, uh, when it comes to the macro concerns in India, inflation is still uh, sticky at this point in time, especially core inflation and CPI, food inflation essentially. With slowdown in growth, how do you see the RBI managing the growth inflation equation under Dr. Raghuram Rajan? And what is your expectation on what may happen with rates? Well, I think this is a very, very critical issue. And I think probably the most important issue in terms of um, the key macro um, issue for India going forward. I think. Um, the, the new RBI governor has a very clear policy dilemma um, which you know, he has to deal with, which is um, you know, inflation continues to remain quite sticky. Um, and we, you know, we think that the, you know, the inflation level will remain fairly sticky at around the 5 to 6% mark. Whereas obviously you've still got um, growth slowing and um, you know, a lack of business confidence. And, and on top of that, obviously, uh, the rupee um, which is clearly, um, you know, the, the number one concern of the, um, you know, the, the authorities at the moment. So it's a very fine uh, balancing act um, for, the, for the new uh, governor. And clearly, I think his number one priority will be to get the currency, um, you know, more stable and, um, you know, kind of uh, contain the, uh, the recent depreciation of the currency before, you know, trying to roll back some of those measures and, and then focusing back on growth. But as I said, it's a very delicate and um, interesting time because it's a, it's, a, it's a very clear policy dilemma that the, uh, the RBI has at the moment. Right, Sam, but with the currency at record lows and uh, India's valuations at 13, 14 times uh, 
one year forward earnings uh, you know don't you think both these factors make a compelling case to buy india right now because you benefit both on the currency side and also benefit from attractive valuations it does yes it does because obviously you've now had 12 13% depreciation in the currency year to date um you've got um you know valuations at much more attractive levels the i guess the question which is holding back investors in the very short term is you know whether there's going to be further a further policy response by the reserve bank of india which um you know could could um have have a short term impact on the market so i guess that could be something which is holding back investors but on a on a medium term view definitely um you know some of the um you know there's 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 a lot of attractive companies out there and um you know this this is i think providing a good entry point for for investors who can take a medium term view right what do you make of the growth over the next 6 to 12 months in india what is what is it that you're penciling in well we had um forecast um economic growth of 5.5% for this year um with the rbi measures we've actually just um taken that back to 5.3% um in our base case is that india will um kind of move along with this sort of 5 5.3% type growth um for the next 12 months and really growth won't recover until after the elections next year you know when when the new government comes in i mean that's that's the next kind of critical point for india we believe um until then we think growth will kind of continue at this kind of 5 to 5.3% level for for the next few quarters all right i want your view on india for 2014 given that we have elections uh, midway through the year what is the expectation how do you think india would uh, perform before the election event well we think um there will be some kind of nervousness probably around the election time but once you've got the new government in power you know once they've um once a coalition has been formed um and you know once we potentially start seeing some some moves to try and revive growth in india um hopefully some reforms um then that will you know that will kind of improve confidence um you know our expectation is that the um you know that the congress will either come back or the bjp will come back with a with a coalition government um but basically um you know once that takes place you know the the new government can then come back in and and start focusing on trying to trying to implement some some measures to help help revive growth The finance minister in India uh, Sam has spoken about quasi sovereign bonds uh, and ECB issuances to finance CAD and keep it at 4.8% uh, uh, as an investor does that comfort you Well I think as um as I mentioned earlier there will have to be potentially there may be some more policies to um in the near term to try and kind of shore up confidence in the rupee and I think um some of the measures that you just outlined could could happen I mean we think there's a good chance of you know some sort of um bond uh, being issued into the international markets um and that could be quite um a confidence boosting measure to the rupee so i think there's a there's you know there's clearly discussions taking place about some sort of uh, bond um uh, being issued and um you know we think that's a there is a a, a good a, a high likelihood of that happening in the near term and that would potentially um help help improve um you know confidence in the rupee Sam let's talk about sectors and stocks you hold TCS uh, versus other IT majors what's the view now on a Wipro and Infi post earnings we've seen already the story uh, on the price uh, play out for both TCS and HCL Tech but do you think the tide is turning for Wipro and Infi well i think TCS continues to be the kind of stand out uh, company to own in the IT sector and they've got a a very strong business model um they've got very uh, strong depth in terms of the management team and 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 how they run the organization and they've had several years now of um growing the business um you know and again several years now in terms of winning new business so they are by far the stand out company in terms of the uh, the sector i think i would i would view um emphasis and wipro as the sort of turn around candidates I don't think there's enough evidence yet to to suggest that they are they have turned the the businesses around. Obviously there's been some excitement um around emphasis but there's still um you know we still need to see more evidence of of them actually um you know going out there winning new business and 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 in, increasing um revenues in both the case of Emphasis and Wipro. So we're still 
uh, cautious of those two companies and, and still have a strong preference towards TCS. Among consumer names, uh, you prefer ITC to HUL. Why is that? Well, ITC continues to be, in our view, you know, one of the best consumption plays in India. Um, I mean, if you look at what they've achieved in terms of the cigarette business, their distribution reach, um, and the potential for them to continue growing, you know, helped by their exposure to rural India. I mean, it's a, it's a fabulous five or ten year consumption story in India, and they've got obviously very strong pricing power as well. And you know, the, um, with the FMCG business as well, and now, now breaking even, that that will be um, part of, you know, that will help part of the earnings growth going forward. So the, you know, when you look at the overall picture for ITC, the returns they've delivered, um, the potential for them to again improve um, dividend payouts, shareholder returns, it's, it's uh, in our view one of the strongest consumption stories in emerging markets. Um, Hindustan Unilever again is a, a very solid uh, quality company, it's just more a question of valuations, um, you know, given, given the recent sort of move in the share price, the valuations have new, now moved to quite high levels. So, um, that's largely because of the, the valuation, but, but you know, we still think on a, on a, on a medium to long term view it's a high quality company in India. Right, Sam, you hold uh, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank. What's the view on the banking space? Uh, for they have seen a significant fall. Do you prefer banks still? Um, is the fall really an opportunity to buy and add more to your existing holdings? Well, the, uh, the banks have obviously sold off um, of the past several weeks with the RBI measures and um, you know it's an obvious area where people will get worried about given the fact that the economy is slowing um, you know inflation has picked up and the rupees weakened it's clearly you know some some shorter term investors have, have have kind of exited positions but I mean I think um, if you look at the, 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 the banks we own in particular HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank and HDFC they have been very successful in terms of managing the economic cycle, through the economic cycle in India. I mean, they've gone through the ups and downs in India over the past, you know, 15 to 20 years. You know, they're, 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 all three of those banks are very conservatively run. Um, they, you know, they've got very good uh, franchises in terms of their assets and their liabilities. They've, you know, got strong um, deposit franchises, which, which help. So, you know, we're very comfortable with those positions. We will be looking to add to those banking positions on any, you know, weekdays because, as I mentioned uh, earlier on in the interview, once we see signs of stabilisation in, in the monetary policy outlook in India, we think, you know, these, these banks will perform very, very well, even though, you know, in the very, very short term, you know, they, they could continue to, to, to be volatile, um, you know, in, you know given, given what's happening in the market. You know, Sun Pharma and Cipla delivered good earnings as well. Uh, is Pharma an overweight for you? Your overall exposure is very low to healthcare. Well, yeah, Pharma is actually an overweight for us as well. So um, companies like Sun Pharmaceuticals, which you know, are very, has got a fantastic franchise um, in India, in terms of um, you know the, the focus on chronic uh, diseases. It's got a very strong franchise in in the US as well. Um, they've delivered solid growth over the past um, you know eight to ten years. Glenmark again is a very interesting story on the uh, the pharmaceutical space. Again, uh, both you know strong in India and you know growing its U.S. business. So they're they're the two stocks we really like in the pharmaceutical space, and they're the ones that we would be backing uh, going forward. Okay, Reliance Industries also seems to have broken out from its uh, broad range of 750 to 850 odd uh, for now at least. So what's the view on Reliance since you track that company? Well, RIL has, uh, is at a, a very interesting kind of juncture. They've got some very big expansion plans, you know, coming on stream um, in the next um, three years. You know, we think um, they need to bring those projects on stream, uh, bring them on, you know, in line with their sort of stated goals. Um, also, they've got to sort of arrest a decline in the KGD6 basin. I think once they do that, then, you know, the company may, may start attracting some more kind of investor interest but at the moment clearly RIL has been out of favour given given the sort of cyclical nature of the business and the problems they've faced um, you know with the KGD6 block. Right among autos you like M&M is there any other rural led story uh, that you think has value? Well in terms of the rural stories it's companies like um, ITC and uh, HDSC Bank actually now we think is becoming a or going to become a very strong sort of rural or semi-urban story because you know, over the past three years, they've expanded their branch network quite significantly, and 
Um, they now have 50% of their branches in, in rural and semi-urban areas, so they're very, in a very strong position to capitalise on the, the growth in rural incomes um, going forward. And also, you know, where they're positioned now, um, they're, uh, in, in a lot of uh, cases in these rural areas, they're the only private sector bank. So they're in a very good position to, you know, take away some of the market share that the public sector banks have in these rural areas. And, and in our view, you know, a very, apart from being just a really good story, it's going to, HGFC Bank, I think, in my opinion, is going to, you know, be a, a good play on the rural areas and semi-urban areas in India going forward. And finally, uh, Sam, are, are mid-caps and small caps a complete avoid for you in India because the focus in your portfolio seems to be with the large caps? Well, the quick answer to that is yes. I think there's um, a lot of risks still surrounding these kind of mid-caps and small caps, particularly in the kind of property and the um, infrastructure areas. I mean, we've seen some significant share price falls in some of these stocks here to date. Um, would I be buying any of these companies? Um, definitely not. I think there's a chance that, you know, the situation does get quite bad for um, some of these mid-cap stocks. We could actually even see a bankruptcy in one or two of these mid-cap names in, you know, in the infrastructure segment or the property segment. So. I personally wouldn't be putting any of my money into these names. I think the, the risks are high. One's got to bear in mind that the, the economic climate in India is going to be challenging for the next few quarters, and companies with you know high gearing, you know, are going to be you know are going to have a very very difficult time. So um, I would I would sound a sort of word of caution to investors and just advise investors really to stick with quality companies, um, you know, over, over the next um, few you know several months and a and, and few years in India. I think that's the best strategy for India going forward. Well, Sam, thanks very much for joining us and giving us your perspective uh, on uh, India as well as emerging markets. Uh, with that, we come to the end of this edition of the FI View. Catch you with another special guest uh, next week. Thanks very much for watching.